Nina Gordon, <laughs> Louise Post, Veruca Salt, and me, and you, right now. I would be loath to relegate Veruca Salt to the pejorative term of being a 90s band. I think it is isolating, marginalizing. However, you were a band that played in the 90s. That was a decade that had great velocity with music. Bands are coming out and, and the, the music is, is driving and you all were part of that. So you stepped on a very fast moving train with a single that everyone said, we'll take that and you had great success early on. What was that like? Like, well, here's our record, and you're kind of in the fast lane as far as like an indie band. Well, I mean, it was, it was all we knew. Like, we did not have the experience that so many bands had. Which Knocking is, yourself out in the clubs for yes, years and years and years. I mean, we played a few shows, and then all of a sudden people were flying in from Los Angeles to hear us play at a tiny little club in Chicago or at South by Southwest in Austin. So it was thrilling. And then it hit us that it was overwhelming and terrifying. But at the beginning, it was just like, hey, this is great. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, it was amazing. But it was, we didn't get to really, we cut our teeth like in public and on MTV. And so um, that, was, that was hard because we weren't really a, a seasoned band yet. Right. And in fact, uh, the single Seether came out um, before American Thighs was released. We it was, just, it was a single. It was a single. It was on a 7-inch. We just wanted to see our 7-inch in the record store. That was the goal. Sure. <laughs> you know? So we released our 7-inch, and someone, um, someone from Hits Magazine heard it. And we didn't know what Hits Magazine was, but someone from there heard it and sent it to the program director at K-Rock. We didn't know uh, what K-Rock was. We didn't know what K-Rock <laughs> was. And um, we were signed, like, after our third show to an indie label called Minty Fresh in Chicago. And um, we were just like, sure, okay. <laughs> um, and he had connections in England, so he got our single over there. And all of a sudden, Seether, the song, was a hit. Right. And we were asking K-Rock to hold back on playing it because our record wasn't available yet. Nothing was available. Um, and that's sort of how things went for us. It was all kind of before we were ready, you know? Although, of course, it was what, it was our wildest dreams come true. Sure. But there we were, suddenly, um, I remember looking at my answering machine, right, which we had then, and there were like 17 messages blinking at when I came home one day, and I thought, I can't handle this. This is too much. Because so many people wanted to be a part of this ascent. In that time, were you aware that you hadn't done, you know, three intense years in the van that smells of socks playing every miserable <laughs> joint? Uh, yeah, from we did some of that. We yeah. did. We did. We loaded gear. We, we loaded gear. our own gear. We spent we spent plenty of time in a van. We with, slept on floors in terrible hotels. Yeah, and, we yeah. did some of that, but not for years. Right. We did that for like months, two weeks. a year, maybe. <laughs> um, but we did, and um, but you know, it was that's just what was happening in sure. Chicago. Like everyone we knew was getting signed. Everyone. Yep. Not everyone had a hit on the radio, but every, I mean, our boyfriends were in bands. They were all signed to major labels. Like, it was just, it was this crazy feeding frenzy in Chicago because of Smashing Pumpkins sure. and Liz Fair mm -hmm. and Urge Overkill. And so people were just there all the time. So this was kind of happening to everyone. You follow up American Thighs with Eight Arms to Hold You, which has yet another big single. And, and so is there any point where you all had the idea that there's too many cooks in the kitchen, where maybe the corporate cart is leading the artistic horse. So uh, we never felt like um, anyone was driving us artistically, but there was the pressure, the pressure of singles. That was, that is always, I think, for any band, unless you are like a pop star who like that's your job to write you know you or, or to perform but were you all getting treated like that that's my question were you all being like kind of 
forced into like can you make the record like 10 of those that single no. can you make like 10 of those no. no we had cool people around us we really did okay. we had a great a and r guy we had people that really liked what we were doing and i think understood who we were there was pressure like you know louise and i left to our own devices we might there might have been like 20 you know nine minute songs on an album because we love the epic jams like long brooding can we say fucker on this <laughs> we call them epic fuckers epic fuckers, fuckers. like the long brooding sure. bubbling simmering anthemic kind of songs um and we may not have written you know three or four minute little you know rave up kind of songs but i don't feel like we did the only pressure the pressure we felt was like to succeed to outdo ourselves okay. to get better as but there was we... the single thing oh there... yeah well and that also because you all had them and they they turned into like gold records well what happened was we um we got caught in this mess of like a spider web of um of of the decision making and being coming from all different places. So maybe the to your point, we had people at Gevin who wanted to choose the single. We had management who wanted to choose the single. We had a lot of different people who thought they knew exactly what the single should be, like the follow-up single. And they differed in opinion. So we struggled with, do we just go with our label? Because they're going to be, you know, they're working this album. Or do we listen to our management who are like going to just muscle through whatever the label thinks because they think they know best. And by the second record, Nina and I decided we're done with the infighting. Of course, it was just the beginning of the infighting. <laughs> but we were at this point, we were thought we're done with the infighting. We've hired these like high powered managers. We're going to let them make the decisions. Yeah, about, about the marketing about, of the yeah. album and the promotion of the album, not about the content of the no, album. No, no. Yeah. The music uh, aspects of it became political. Who do we go with? Right. This person has an idea for the single, but then yeah. there's, well, you know, he, she has a very uh, big opinion. And all of a sudden you're like, well, wait a minute. We just want to make some songs. Right. And we started second guessing our instincts right. and we started miscommunicating. And that was really the big problem for us because we were, we were kind of uh, suffocating with the pressure of having to follow up. See, there was something that was equally as big to the point where we, we had a video made by this guy's, um, was it Steve Hamps? Is that his name? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Who had done Beck's Loser and Beer Can videos. And we loved his aesthetic. We asked him to do a video for a song called Number One Blind, which was our second single on American Thighs. And he did this really creative, like, quirky video um, and beautiful video in hindsight. But we had a pan we panicked about it and thought it wasn't good enough to, re to release. So we actually just pulled the video back and the record kind of went black, you know, like that was it. Like that was our big push. That was our second single. And we panicked and said, we don't want to release this video. And it was just a weird moment of panic for us because we were at this point in the pressure cooker and we weren't, um, we weren't necessarily making the right choices, you know, because we were second guessing everything. No. And it's, and I, as listening to Louise talk about it, I'm realizing like, where was the person, whether it was in our band or in our you know, management who was just saying, you guys, you don't, you don't need to worry about this. Like the bar was set from the beginning, I think because things happen so right, fast, right. we were like, oh my God, now we're on a bus. Well, we want to stay on a bus. So we got to, we got to, mm -hmm. you know, keep. And if there had been someone in our midst who had said, you guys are artists. The thing you love to do most in the world is play music, sing together, record together. Like that's what you love and go, and go play live. And like, who cares? Like singles, singles schmingles, like, and business and money and all of that stuff. We really did. It was like, we, we were not really nurtured as artists. Right. And we didn't nurture ourselves mm -hmm. as artists. We got caught up in it. A lot of record stores in Chicago. Uh, a lot of great ones, not as many as there used to be, just yeah. because of uh, the sadness of, of life. Are you all record store fans? Do you go into the record store? Are you record buyers? So not as much as I used to be. Um, and, and most of the vinyl that I purchase at this point in my life is online just because of convenience. Okay. And I, we have little kids. I have little kids. And... Um, and so, but certainly was, I mean, in Chicago, like, you know, I grew up going to Wax Tracks as a teenager and that was the coolest, I mean, that was the coolest place you could hang out in Chicago when you were underage and, you know, weren't going to shows yet or whatever. Um, and 
I love record stores. I love the energy in a record store. I just don't have the time as much as I used right. to. But yeah. anytime I find myself in one, I'm just like, I love the rhythm of looking through records. And I was yeah. thinking about this in terms of my own children who, and all kids, and you know, now, like, you don't really do that. I mean, you're just looking on your phone or you're looking online or you're whatever, but like, just the rhythm of flipping through vinyl. Well, it's and like, pouring over the artwork. And pouring and, over the artwork. you know, obsessing over the way people look and the inner, the, just the chemistry of the band that you can see in a photo um, and, like, in rumors. You know, just wanting to know more about these people and, and their outfits, like the B-52s. And <laughs> um, I grew up, like Nina, going to record stores and um, just being fascinated. It was the best thing to do, like, just going to record stores. And then, you know, well, you know, through college and then into living in Chicago where I met Nina, we went to go to Reckless Records and buy all of our records there. And, um, and now um, my husband is, is vinyl obsessed. So he subscribes to Vinyl Me Please and he gets so many albums. And our, rec our record collection is gigantic. Um, and I hear all these new bands because of him. And it's exciting. The vinyl is so beautiful. Like the artwork that's coming out right now is is astonishing, really. And so we totally geek out over it. He especially geeks out over it. But um, they're just these beautiful pieces of art that come into our home. No doubt, you all started out as you know, listening to the radio, buying records, going to the record store, and then you became songwriters. So talk about if you can speak to that transition from a consumer of music to a creator of music. I mean, I feel like musicians and performers in general are exhibitionists and songwriters are exhibitionists. I and agree. we certainly started at a time when the music that we loved the most lyrically was very cryptic. So like Nirvana lyrics, Breeders lyrics, you know, Pixies, My Bloody Valentine, you didn't really know what these songs were about. But we also grew up listening to, you know, great singer songwriters who were talking about very literal things in their lives. So we kind of had both of that. We sort of toyed with writing lyrics that were a little more cryptic, like come up with a cool word, but then spill your heart because ultimately our songs, I think as songwriters, both Louise and I were never happy unless we were spilling our hearts. Yeah. Like, what was it like externalizing the, in, the uh, internal, because that's your new job? The process was what was important, the exercise of releasing the demons, the feelings, whatever. And for me, songwriting, and I think I can, Nina shares this, is, is often just revelatory in that I don't really know what's going on with me that day until I sit down with a guitar and then it starts coming out. And usually the lyrics come with the chords and they're all together. And then the song begins to take shape and then we craft our lyrics. But originally, we generally speaking, I don't, and I don't believe Nina does either, set out to write a song about a particular thing. Um, as much as just let it come out whatever is happening that day. So it's this organic process. And then suddenly we're writing a song about our boyfriend who smokes too much pot or, you know, we, you know, our, my first song was called The Youngest Child. And it was about my little brother. <laughs> and um, it was very special to me because it was the first song I wrote, you know, and um, I always think that it's, uh, it's illuminating. You know, we get to know ourselves better through our own music. And then by the time it gets to somebody else's ears, it's sort of none of our business, you know? To, to me, uh, American Thighs and Eight Arms to Hold You uh, sound like 90s records. You know, just, you're like, you know, here comes the guitar, wham! And it's just a <laughs> big, just big sound. And, and I, I like those records, truly. There's so many things about Ghost Notes that says to me there's a confidence there. There is restraint, knowing that we don't have to push everything into the red all the time. There's a maturity that's not old. It's just like, <laughs> I really know what I want to say. I know what I want to play. And I know where I want to place emphasis on notes. And, and I think it's such a, an evolved record. Uh, I just think there's just a great journey that you all have been through that made you arrive at Ghost Notes, where, and I know we could spend an hour <laughs> on the journey of Veruca Salt. But I, I think there is uh, so many good things about this record that you all could not have done all those years ago with American Thighs and Eight Arms to Hold You that is now possible for wherever you all are at in your stage and station in life. And I hear that on Ghost Notes. It's like it really comes out that the confidence 
a real beautiful thing is happening on that record. What were you finding getting back together again, uh, rediscovering and remembering that the uniqueness of the two of you together? We were so happy to be back together. And all of the stuff that had um, controlled us before and I think and interfered with our, our creative relationship and our friendship was gone. You know, it had fallen away because we had made peace with, I think, ourselves separately from one another. I don't think, I know. Um, and then together, which was the ultimate healing moment for us. And beyond that, we got to make music again. Like, you know, it was incredible. It's like we got we, we got to have a, you know, an, a, another go at it, another chapter that neither of us had anticipated. I think we both thought, okay, the coffin is sealed. We're moving on with our lives. Even after we made peace, we weren't sure if we would be making music. And then nothing necessarily beyond like some kind of reunion tour. But when we started singing and playing together, it was v very quick, quickly revealed to us that we had more to say and more to do together. And um, I brought a song to Nina that she said made her feel like, oh, made her realize, oh, we're making a record now. The song called Alternica, which was very much about the time that we sort of grew up together. Um, and so it was, it was incredible. Like I was, I was really floating on air the whole time we were making that record because um, not only did we heal our like uh, outstanding wounds, but we got to to heal all the stuff with the guys as well with Steve and Jim and become a band together. And as you know better than anyone, a band is like a family. And when that when there's a rift in the family, you may all go about your business and continue your lives, but there's always going to be that empty place. Um, and we had this incredible chance to get back together and do it another album. And we still do, but um, that was just such a moment for us. So I think we were much, I think can speak for myself, um, a much um, more, you know, able to hear um, dissent or criticism, you know, Definitely. other people having different opinions. Uh, it wasn't so threatening. Things weren't so precious to us anymore. We, we had forged our identities. We knew who we were with and without each other. And we saw this as like icing on the cake. Like, oh my God, you know, we get to play and write with each other again. Where, you know, whereas in the past we might have felt threatened by each other's opinions or, you know, f like people were kind of overstepping their boundaries. Um, we were no longer like, injured by those things. We were welcoming them, if anything. And believe me, there were prickly moments because old stuff like old dynamics reared their heads. But we, we just recognized them for what they were. Luckily, we had the gift of, of um, perspective. Right. And you know, we were able to make this record that we all felt really good about. It doesn't always happen when bands get back together. Sometimes the, the reunion thing it sounds really yeah. like, we're going back to the base. Like, don't go back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Don't, don't, yeah. It'll never work. Because yeah. now you're guessing it. Just go be here now in it. And that that's what Ghost Notes is to me. I'm like, wow, how good. They they, they ha still have something to say. Yeah. And, and, and so I just hope that you all do more because uh, I think you're really <laughs> doing something good. And so you still live near each other. You're yes, still local. Yes, we do. And so mm -hmm. you can get together anytime. So you have no excuses. <laughs> well, our, our rhythm section is not, not in L.A., but um, we managed to get together. But... Um, Thank you again. And also, <laughs> regarding that, Nina and I, um, so we started out with acoustic guitars, just me and her, and then we got these, cop we, I got a Les Paul copy, and she got an SG copy, and we fa <laughs> got fuzz pedals, and we started making a bigger sound, but we really want to make a beautiful record in which you can really, um, we can really play with our vocals more and uh, defy the, the genre, really, and not, and beyond just not being a shitty comeback record, we want to make another beautiful album that is a d transcends the, the whole genre. One last question, super teeny tiny. Uh, I, I am not a super expert on the entire Veruca Salt catalog, but I'm, but I'm pretty on it. There is, with great exception with Veruca Salt records, a vinyl component to every Veruca Salt record. There's, there's some CD promos, and like uh, I think there's one CD EP that's not on vinyl, but pretty much there's a vinyl component. That says to me, and tell me if I'm wrong, that vinyl is important 
to you all important to what Veruca Salt is doing? Oh, yeah. I mean, vinyl, that's the thing. Like, when American Thighs went gold and they were like, we're going to send you your gold records, they were going to send us yeah. a gold record with a CD on it, and we're like, no, 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 no. Like, we need <laughs> a gold record with a gold record on it. Like, we grew up with vinyl. So to us, that's what, that's the real, that's the real deal. And so we still really cherish that. And we will always, whatever we do, we will always make vinyl because it's, it's what we love. And it gives you an opportunity, again, with artwork, with everything, you know, and just the process and the ritual of it. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's, it just doesn't feel real to us unless it's on vinyl. All right, because it also it's tactile, and you touch it, and you feel it, and you feel the, 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 the weight of it. And um, being able to see the needle on the vinyl is, is like nothing else. You know, yeah. I mean, it's still a miracle to me. The fact that that's, <laughs> that that is, you know, that happens. My daughter was trying to ask, was asking me how, wh how that works. And I didn't really have the best explanation. I said, I think it's magic. <laughs> 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 that's how I still feel about it. Perfect.